This year, 2021, marks the 100th birthday year of the great Russian trumpeter Timothy Dobschitzer. So when J.C. Dobzhelewski asked me if I could do some sort of video presentation for this year's ITG conference, I felt that it was a perfect opportunity to pay tribute to one of the world's greatest musical artists who enjoyed a fruitful and meaningful relationship with the International Trumpet Guild. I was introduced to the name Timothy Dachitzer during the 1970 National Trumpet Symposium at the University of Denver. Lee Burns, trumpet professor there from 1967 to 1973, established the symposium in 1968. It eventually grew from 40 to 500 attendees each summer for a fun-filled week with artists such as Dizzy Gillespie, Maurice Andre, Bill Chase, Don Ellis, Mel Broyles, Robert Nagel, Gerard Schwartz, William Vacchiano, Tom Stevens, Maynard Ferguson, Clark Terry, Ed Tarr, Bud Brisboy, and many others. Unfortunately, the symposium died when Burns took a position as orchestra director at the University of Oklahoma in late 1973. During most of that time, I was an undergraduate trumpet student at the University of Colorado in Boulder, just a 30 minute drive from DU. So I was able to attend all of the symposiums Lee hosted. It was during a session given by Lewis Davidson that the name Dachitzer came up. Lou had played principal trumpet in the Cleveland Orchestra for 23 years before accepting a professorship at Indiana University in 1963. In Bloomington in 1965, he attended a concert by the State Symphony Orchestra of the USSR. The principal trumpet player was especially good and Davidson went backstage after the concert to meet him. It turned out that the Soviet government had peppered the orchestra with several guest principal players, including the first trumpet, Timothy Dachitzer. Davidson could not speak Russian and Dachitzer could not speak much English, but both could speak a little Yiddish. They quickly became friends, often exchanging letters, recordings, and music. One of the recordings Dachitzer gave to Davidson was a solo album he had recorded with piano accompaniment, which included exquisite performances of Horace Staccato, Rachmaninoff's Vocalese, Gypsy Airs by Sarasate, and other virtuoso pieces. Because copyright laws were not observed between the Soviet Union and the US, Dachitzer allowed Davidson to issue the album for sale in America. Davidson's self-produced LP of Dachitzer was unveiled during a session and a couple of tracks were played for the audience. After the session, many of us lined up to purchase copies. Over the next few months, I must have listened to that album hundreds of times, and I soon added Dachitzer to my list of trumpet gods that included Rafael Mendes, Maurice Andre, Doc Severinsen, Al Hurt, and a few others. I could not have imagined at the time that I would soon become good friends with Dachitzer. As many of you know, Timothy Dachitzer was considered to be Russia's greatest trumpeter and one of the most beloved musicians in the world. His artistry and popularity rivaled that of Maurice Andre and Louis Armstrong, and he played with the flair of the great violinist and the musical passion of an operatic tenor. I um, got a phone call from my uncle Louis Davidson at 9 a.m. one morning, who was still playing in the Cleveland Orchestra. No, no, I'm sorry, he was at uh, Indiana University. And these were his exact words as I said, hello. He said, Ronnie, I heard God play the trumpet last night. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, this Russian orchestra came through and this gentleman named Timofey Dorschitzer came to my home as I normally invite all guests who are coming through Bloomington. And uh, after we ate and drank, I played some recordings of him for, from the Cleveland Orchestra, things that I had done. And at one o'clock in the morning, he took his trumpet out in my basement where we entertained and started to play 
and I felt like I was hearing God play the trumpet. And he said, it was so remarkable that I'm, I'm completely overwhelmed. There are numerous spellings of Dachitzer's name. This is because the transliteration of his name from the Cyrillic varies from country to country. I am using the spelling suggested by the International Trumpet Guild, which is the way it appears on the English edition of his autobiography published by ITG. Dachitzer was born on December 13, 1921, and grew up in a musical family. His father was a violinist, trumpeter, conductor, and composer who performed mostly for silent movies, and his brother Vladimir became a trumpeter too. Dachitzer's three uncles were also musicians. When the new economic policy was established in the Soviet Union by Lenin in 1921, the country thrived for a while. But in 1922, the policy was rescinded. The country suffered economically and the Dachitzer family also became poor. When Tima, his nickname, was 11, the family moved from the little Ukrainian town of Nizhyn to Moscow, where they lived with his father's sister and family. It was very crowded. At night, a sheet was hung across the main living room to separate the two families. Timothy was sent to a military school where he learned to play cornet in the 62nd Cavalry Regiment Orchestra from 1932 to 1933. He then attended the Gnesin Institute of Music in Moscow, where he studied with the great trumpeter Mikhail Tabakov for eight years. Tabakov was principal trumpet of the Bolshoi Ballet Orchestra, and he sometimes hired Dachitzer as an extra player. Dachitzer improved rapidly, and at age 19 won third prize in the All-Union Brass Instrument Performers Competition in 1941. He later won first prize in the first International Youth Festival competition in Prague in 1947. While in school, Dachitzer fell in love with a soprano at the Institute, Faina Semenovna Hovkina, and they were married in 1945. Three years later, they had a son, Sergei, who became a bassoonist. My grandfather overall, first and foremost, was always a family man. Family was number one. He loved family gatherings. Um, he loved hosting. Uh, 
he loved a table full of guests and good food um he uh, loved his siblings so very often maybe a couple of weekends a month even if i'm not mistaken i was a bit young but um i do remember those moments quite clearly a couple of weekends a month we would take a trip to his sister Zena's house she was the oldest out of all the kids um Zena lived near this beautiful park um with her husband anatoly and it would be the entire family it would be my mom and my dad Timofey, my, my grandfather and my grandmother Mona and his brother Vladimir and his wife Tatiana and their son Alexander as well as Zena's kids Irina and Alec and we would go early we would start with this long walk at the park my grandfather loved nature he loved the forest the hiking walks um, and then we would come back to have a big meal at Zena's house that she prepared. Um, and my grandfather was really, um, those moments were very important for him. Dukchitsa replaced Tabakov in the Bolshoi Ballet Orchestra in 1945. And he finally graduated from the Gnesin Institute under Tabakov in 1950. He continued his studies at the Institute until 1957, but this time concentrating on conducting and harmony. Unfortunately, Faina died at the young age of 49. Two years later, Timothy married the famous ceramic artist Mona Hanovna Rakas, and they remained together for the rest of his life. Dukchitzer developed his skills as a solo artist and was often featured in performances by the Bolshoi Orchestra. He began recording albums with the orchestra for the Russian label Melodia, which were issued worldwide. Many composers wrote concert works for him, including Aratunian, his theme and variations, Weinberg, Peskin, Tamburg, and dozens of others. He also replaced Tabakov as trumpet professor at the Gnesin Institute in 1956. In addition, he was one of the assistant conductors of the Bolshoi Ballet Orchestra.
Uh, for me, Timofey is not uh, especially a Russian trumpet player. He is a uh, unique musician. Uh, because right, uh, I, uh, I know when I prepared uh, to our meeting, I think about this and I know to only two person who is unique as musician is Timothy and Rafael Mendes. Somebody play, uh, somebody say what uh, Timothy play like a vocalist. But for me, his manner is more violinist. Um, vibrato, legato, some articulation and repertoire, of course. As a, as a trumpet soloist, how would uh, Vadim describe Doc Schitzer? Как солист, как ну трубач солист, то есть не оркестровый. Как как вы можете описать Доc Schitzer? Ну что это вот невероятно талантливый и невероятно оригинальный что ли? Вот я говорю единственный. Я считаю, что Просто его даже сравнивать ни с кем нельзя, потому что это настолько своеобразный музыкант, но очень яркий. So uh, he's really unique, really original and uh, uncomparable with anybody. So and he really bright and uh, outstanding musician. So I uh, and he think that it's it will never happen again. This this kind of um, Musician will be born in, in that world. Я вот уже говорил об этом, что некоторые люди пытались повторить и играли, ну под него так в его стиле, но вместо такого возвышенного звучания у всех получалось совсем наоборот. And uh, Vadim wants to repeat that uh, lots of people trying to copy him, uh, but instead of this nice and and bright style, uh, they just did something, some mess, and that's it. <laughs> so no, nobody can can copy it. Он ведь такой оригинальный не только звучание или техники, но и в трактовке произведений. Mm -hmm. Некоторые сочинения, и даже в оркестре встречалось соло, он играл по-особенному. Mm -hmm. So he, he, basically he is not, not even original in a sound or phrasing. Also he really, really, uh, okay, sorry, he really original in a thinking of music when he's been playing. Also in orchestra, some solos, he's been playing Totally different from uh, all trumpet players. Probably different uh, phrasing or dif different articulation some, some, somewhere, but every time it was like perfect. И вот это вот личное, его особенное, оно присутствовало в нем все время. Даже Ромео Джулиет в спектакле, он играл все время корнету, конечно, партию корнета сольную. And that you know that's something uh, personal inside of him it's it's it was everywhere and uh, everywhere in his life and also in the playing as example he's been playing like uh, in romeo, romeo Juliet, Roma in a romeo and juliet only cornet part and there is lots of solos as, as you know david <laughs> And, so, and sometimes he, he could make like written auto when, when it's where it doesn't marked. Yeah, and, and conductors, you, you can understand conductors in, the, in, the, in that time, like they were like what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. doing the poker face, of course. <laughs> А в случае с Тимофеем Санчем они поворачивались и только улыбались. And, and, and when Doc Schitzer did that, they only smile. That's it. Like, I mean, kind smile. Настолько yeah. он это yeah, делал so... 
So that, that was so beautiful that they couldn't even make a make make a not poker, sorry, like angry face, yeah. Doc Chizer was honored by the Soviet government in 1959 and 1978 and was given a small cottage in the woods outside of Moscow as a vacation home. Although this was a great gesture, Doc Chizer described the cottage to me as a small one-room brick shack with no plumbing, electricity, or fireplace. He worked on this cottage for years before it was habitable. I first met Doc Schitzer in Montreux, Switzerland during the 1976 World Brass Congress hosted by Richard Zellner and Harvey Phillips. He gave a spectacular recital with piano. Afterwards, I was able to speak with him through an interpreter. I told him that I was to host the 1977 ITG conference at the University of Illinois and that I wanted him to be the featured artist. To my amazement, Doc Schitzer became very excited about this possibility. We exchanged addresses and he gave me the name and address of the person I should write to at the Soviet Ministry of Culture and that all of my correspondence should be copied to Doc Schitzer so that he could follow up on every step of what would be a long and arduous process. I was fortunate in finding a graduate voice major at the University of Illinois who spoke fluent Russian. He helped translate letters I received from Doc Schitzer and the Ministry of Culture. I was also fortunate to have been a close friend of John Garvey, our university jazz director, who had gone through a similar process to take his top jazz band to Russia for a tour. I let John proof every letter before I sent it to the Ministry of Culture. I'll always remember John's reaction to the first sentence of my formal request to allow Doc Schitzer to come to America. I had written something like, on behalf of the International Trumpet Guild, I would like to invite the esteemed Soviet trumpeter, Timothy Dokchitzer, to be the featured artist during the 1977 conference. Garvey jumped with annoyance. He explained that the Russians felt that Americans were greedy and often made demands for what they wanted. Surely, my first sentence stating I would like would be taken as greedy or demanding. Rather, it should be stated this way. On behalf of the International Trumpet Guild, I humbly request your permission to please allow the esteemed trumpeter, Mr. Timothy Dokchitzer of the famous Bolshoi Ballet Orchestra to be the featured artist during the 1977 ITG conference in Urbana, Illinois, USA. As you know, Mr. Dokchitzer is widely known as the world's greatest trumpet soloist, and it would be an extreme honor for you to allow us the privilege of having him perform for us. Each of the dozens of letters of correspondence I had with the Ministry of Culture was highly scrutinized in this manner. I have often told people that the work involved in getting Doc Chitzer to the ITG conference was as much as all the rest of the work combined. Well, the Soviet Ministry of Culture tried to make it even more difficult when I received a letter a month before the conference stating that it would not be possible for Doc Chitzer to come to America for a single concert and that a tour of six concerts the week prior to the conference would be required. I was told that he was to fly first class whenever possible, stay only in luxury hotels, be given all meals and local transportation, perform only with bands or orchestras, and be paid a cash sum of $600 per concert. Undaunted, I decided to see if I could make this tour happen. Knowing what a great opportunity it was to have Doc Jitzer as a guest soloist and for such a nominal fee, I immediately made a few phone calls to principal chair orchestra players and university professors I knew well. I got some financial help from Reynolds Schilke and the six additional concerts were booked within one week. I'm sure that the powers that be in Moscow were stunned when they received my letter with a complete tour itinerary for Doc Jitzer including flight reservations, hotels, rehearsal schedules, concerts, and names of hosts at each location. I was on pins and needles until I received a call from Lou Davidson that Doc Jitzer had arrived in Toronto on the Russian airline Aeroflot. Davidson had agreed to drive Tima to all the cities during the Midwest tour, making sure that everything went smoothly. 
I still remember my excitement when Lou walked into the Craner Center for the Arts in Urbana with Doc Schutzer and Lou's nephew Ron Modell in hand. They had just come from Tima's performance at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, where Ron was trumpet professor. That was a great day. I remember crying with joy. Doug Schitzer performed a wonderful concert as the finale for the ITG conference. We kept our relationship going by exchanging letters and sending recordings and music from our two countries. I received several LP record albums of Doc Schitzer that I had not seen before. The record covers were made from very flimsy cardboard and tended to fall apart even with the best of handling. He also sent me several autographed scores. A year later, in 1978, the Benz Trumpet Company organized a second solo tour for Doc Schitzer. I believe it was two weeks long. Evidently, the Soviet government trusted Timothy to leave Russia, but as before, Doc Schitzer's wife Mona was required to stay in Moscow, ensuring that he would not defect to America. The last concert on the Benz tour was at the University of Illinois. He performed with our large symphonic band. After the Sunday afternoon concert, I invited Doc Schitzer and his interpreter to my home for dinner with my wife and me. I remember arriving at my home in the country and pushing the button in my car to open the garage door. Tima had never seen an automatic garage door opener before and wanted to push the button himself. We must have sat in my car for another two minutes while he made the door go up and down, giggling the entire time. Doc Schitzer retired from the Bolshoi at the end of the 1984 season, but continued his solo career. In 1989, he was in need of a heart operation, and doctors in Moscow recommended that it be done in Holland. Unfortunately, Doc Schitzer did not have insurance to cover this, and the operation was very costly. I can't remember who called me, but I was informed of the situation and asked if I could help raise some of the funds. People from France, including Maurice André, Switzerland, and Holland, were also given the task of raising money. I was asked to raise $10,000 of the funds needed. Donations were to be given to the ITG, and ITG was then to send the money to a hospital in Holland. I donated $1,000 and immediately called Lou Davidson, Ron Modell, Don Whitaker, and a few others who also made sizable donations. Although everyone pitched in, we were still $5,000 short. I think it was Tony Plogue who knew Herb Alpert personally. Alpert donated the rest of the funds needed, and thanks to numerous trumpet players around the world, Doc Schitzer received heart bypass surgery on April 18, 1989. Doc Schitzer was able to continue his solo career through 1997. I invited him to be one of the artists during the 1995 International Brass Fest in Bloomington, Indiana, which I hosted in conjunction with Summit Brass and the ITG. Since the Soviet Union had dissolved by then, booking his appearance was simple. Doc Schitzer's performance sounded great as usual. After retiring, Doc Schitzer lived the remainder of his life in the town of Vilnius in Lithuania. He passed away on March 16, 2005, 
at age 83 and is buried in Moscow. Well, if you could just kind of summarize in just a few sentences what your overall feelings about him um, would be as a player and, of course, as a person. Well, I found him a, a very generous man in many ways, uh, willing to share uh, everything from how do you do that to uh, just stories and such. Um, but he was, uh, in my mind, he's, he's one of the two or three very best trumpet players ever. And that says a lot, because there are a lot of good trumpet players. But uh, he would take, uh, he grew up, of course, under the communist system and lived there most of his life. Uh, they weren't allowed at certain times to get Western music. And the music they did have was not easily uh, dispersed among the, the Russians and such. Uh, his trumpet until uh, later on was, was uh, not a good instrument. And yet he played it like a violin. I mean, it's just, just incredible. Uh, he had all the range he needed ever, top and bottom, but he played with such heart. I mean, there was, there was soul in his music, even the straightest pieces. Uh, you could just tell through his tone, through his vibrato, through his various nuances that uh, he really felt him. It was just terrific. He was a great player. Yeah. People often commented about Doc Jitzer's formal persona, especially when performing on stage. A concert review in Brass Bulletin magazine described his regal nature as a maestoso stage presence. I remember that he had such a tremendous uh, presence on the stage. Uh, he had a regal kind of nobility about it. He was doing his very calm, totally in command of not only the performance, but, but of the audience. Uh, I believe Joan Schilke is re uh, reputedly to have said uh, sometime before that when he walked in the room that as soon as he walked in the room, you knew that this guy must be a very important person. Because that incident that happened at my school when he appeared at Northern Illinois University, I had sat through hundreds of concerts and recitals in our main concert hall in those many years. And never once did this happen except Doc Sitzer, the minute he came out, the first two steps onto the stage, the entire audience of 798 people stood up, gave him a standing over. He hadn't played a note yet. <laughs> Nobody knew who he was. Wow. No more than all my students knew who he was, but other than five other people, there was practically no uh, advertising, no big records. I do have to and, say, uh, he was always very well put together, and he was always very formal in the sense of his persona and appearance, even if these were just family gatherings, even if, even if we were, um, you know, very casual at the summer house, he was still always very well put together. Although Doc Schitzer performed almost entirely on the B-flat trumpet, he also owned and occasionally used trumpets in C, D, E-flat, and piccolo B-flat or A. His first piccolo trumpet was a bench instrument given to him after signing with that company in 1978. This is the piccolo trumpet he used the last years. Uh, and he recorded his last, uh, I don't remember what it was, but last, last disc he recorded with this trumpet. I still have it. I, sure. I don't play a lot, but <laughs> this is this one, but but I used to play it. Yeah. 
so, Benji. So, uh, he came Benji. to our school to perform with our orchestra under the direction of Anshul Brusilov, the Aratunian and the uh, Kriokov Concerto Pong. He had just changed his affiliation from uh, Selmer trumpets to King Benj, who was playing a Benj trumpet. And the day before he arrived in Denton, uh, he was given a Benj piccolo. Now this is the first piccolo he had ever uh, owned. And so he spent about three or four hours in the motel room playing piccolo trumpet, trying to figure out how to play the damn thing. Then he shows up the next day at North Texas with absolutely no chops whatsoever. <laughs> We've all been there, you know? Yeah. And, and he had blown out his chops over his excitement of finally owning a piccolo trumpet. Of course, Maurice Andre was very popular in those days, and, and he and Dr. Sir kind of uh, woke up the trumpet world to the possibilities of the trumpet as a, as a classical instrument. But of course, Mr. Mr. Doxitzer played only the B flat at those in those days, very occasionally C trumpet. And Maurice was making his entire career playing the piccolo. So uh, Mr. Doxitzer, I guess, figured he had some ground to make up. But anyway, uh, he was supposed to play the Kriakov Concerto Poem and the Aratunian on two successive nights with the orchestra, and he canceled the Kriakov because he just didn't have. So, and then Timofei came and he said, Otto, please, can you show me how you play the piccolo? I would like to learn this from you. I, so I said, oh, because I said, Timofei, you are 73 or 74 years old. I mean, uh, you want to, and then he said, Otto, he was really, we never stop learning. When we stop learning, we are dead. I said, okay, I understand. <laughs> so. Dachitzer recorded only one piece on piccolo, the famous Tartini Concerto made popular by Maurice André. Here's an excerpt from the third movement. Dachitzer loved to teach and presented master classes throughout the world. Being taught himself by the old taskmaster Tabakov, he expected his students to take their lessons seriously and work as hard as possible. We had um, a young, talented student, I don't say from which country, otherwise everybody knows who he is, really talented student, and he should have lesson because uh, Dachitzer was there one week, and he, he missed the lesson of Dachitzer. And Timofei called me, Otto, my student, the student is not here. What is this? I said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know. Well, I, I don't know where. I... So in Russia, this would not go. This is... He was really, he was really upset. I said, please give me a... No, there's no... I said, what would you do in Russia? He said, out. I said, eh, what do you mean? So he insisted that I call, I, I call Tom Stevens, Thibault, <laughs> um, um, Bonilla, so I called everybody and then we kicked him out. <laughs> uh, we like to hear some stories about the uh, teaching of Dr. Schitzer. How, how, what kind of professor he's been? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, the one, he's been speaking not much with uh, students. He, he just coming to the class and uh, take his trumpet out and just play. 
After that, he gives some comments to his own plane. Но он считал, что гораздо полезнее для студентов, чтобы они услышали, чем он будет говорить. So yeah, in his opinion, it was more uh, interesting and useful for students to hear his playing than he hear his talks. <laughs> And it was amazing how he uh, he was so uh, attentive to his audience, and he so wanted to share the knowledge that he's accumulated through his hard labor. He always talks about how um, in his book, right, how he spent the first time, uh, half of his life acquiring the knowledge, um, and then the second part he dedicated to sharing it with uh, his students and anybody who would want to learn something from him. And he decided to uh, um, go to Moscow and do his postgraduate studies with Mr. D uh, because he loved the sound, he loved uh, the artistry and uh, he thought that was the teacher for him. So he went there um, and he didn't even know what Mr. D looked like and he didn't have an appointment. He just went to the Institute of Renaissance and was basically waiting for Mr. D to show up and uh, he was uh, alone in the hall and he saw this uh, gentleman walking toward him. And, but, you know, he didn't know it was Mr. D. So, and as Mr. D approached, he asked my father, so young man, why, who are you waiting for? He's like, well, I'm waiting for uh, the famous trumpeter, Doc Schitzer. And the studio was so kind. He said, "Well, um, thank you. Uh, that that's me." So uh, that's that was their first uh, meeting ever. When Mr. D's, I think it was 60th uh, uh, birthday that was celebrated at the Bolshoi Theater. So my father took his entire class. Uh, I think there were like 13 or 15 of his students. My father brought to Moscow, and everybody got a chance to uh, get into the Bolshoi theater. My father got them all um, passes. And it was just a, a, an unforgettable experience. Uh, all his students still talk about it. I, I still I, a picture, I have a picture of that. So I can send you that in front of the Bolshoi theater, the yeah. entire class. And it was uh, quite a feat because in, in Soviet Union at that time, it was very expensive to go to Moscow and stay, find, find somewhere to stay and feed yourself for several days. Yeah. And for many of those students, that was the first time uh, they came to Moscow and you know, they got to see the best of the best. Mm -hmm. He was in a master class and uh, every, all the kids wanted to play for him. You know, he, he did four days of like three hour master class. And by the fourth day, he says, okay, who's next? The kids had signed up. He, Kid comes up and says, well, we play where he says, uh, Aratunian. Well, he was like, if there were 45 kids that had played for him, you know, 42 of them had played Aratunian. This was his piece, of course, his signature piece, as we all know. He was sick of hearing the Aratunian played and particularly played badly by students. <laughs> he, he went like this. He went, Aratunian, Aratunian, Moratoria, Aratunian. Moratorium on Aratunia. He didn't want to hear any more Aratunia. And, and uh, I thought that was particularly uh, charming. And it was in that class, I think, he expressed the idea of uh, addressing artistic things. But he said, uh, playing the trumpet and, and trying to do it in an artistic way is like painting on water. That you have a conception of a beautiful picture and you very carefully and expertly lay down the colors on the surface of the water and immediately the colors dissipate. And if you're going to try to replicate that picture, you have to do it all over again. And of course, as performers, we know that's true. Uh, you, you can't hang your hat on your last performance. <laughs> uh, you got to play the next one. And, and as, uh, as we know, we're trying always to improve. So Mr. Doctor was motivated uh, this way artistically to always improve and to realize that whatever we're doing artistically is uh, temporary.
uh, for me, uh, uh, Timofey Dokshitzer is like a god uh, because uh, it's, I have I have a big passion now uh, because it's a religious uh, sense about him. Uh, during my uh, school uh, school years, uh, we have uh, we have not a lot of different uh, trumpet recordings, for example, and uh, we don't know some uh, solo trumpet players. Uh, when I was young, till fifteen or sixteen years old, uh, I listened only to person to trumpet player. My favorites, Timothy and Louis Armstrong. It's very strange, but it was very hard times. I, I uh, mean, um, uh, Iron Curtain. Of course, uh, I listened some uh, jazz trumpet players. Uh, I listened some variety players uh, like Vladimir Chizik uh, in Moscow, in, uh, uh, radio and television, big band. But Timothy was unique because all uh, repertoire, a trumpet repertoire, what I know, uh, I listen uh, by his LP. Uh, this uh, is not only for me, all my colleagues, all my uh, generation uh, has same situation. He was like messenger for us about sound, about manner, about articulation, about all, uh, all. and repertoire, of course. Well, it, it was a very uh, good experience for me because after two years, uh, I was first uh, in uh, Prague Spring, where Timothy was uh, like a member of jury and he uh, was with us like like a doctor, like a, a father. He was very open. He was uh, very clever for us. Uh, and uh, after, uh, after the third tour, uh, he invited me to uh, old Jewish uh, restaurant for special food, uh, old Jewish restaurant for special food, for something speaking and uh, like a father, he was like a father in this moment. We were very, I repeat, we were very close. It's like our member, member of our family. He was like uh, my father. <laughs> but uh, what I can say, professionally speaking, um, what was uh, particular in his uh, teaching is his trumpet, always ready to play, and. Uh, uh, all students, it, it was not like you come, you have your uh, uh, half an hour or one hour of lesson, and th then you leave. When he was at his uh, classroom, all his class was present. Usually it was like this, because it uh, doesn't matter if he's working with one of us or with another one, we can still learn many, many, many things, and the magic moments were when he was playing and showing uh, how to, his interpretation and technical uh, details. Did, did he like to teach uh, a lot of the mechanics of playing or was it mainly just talking about music? Both, both. both. Of course, uh, he used to teach uh, techniques, how m m he, he, he uh, paid, always very uh, a lot of attention on uh, producing the sound. So the attack, what we call. And uh, he was never accept, accepting like, wow, wow, this, this uh, uh, maneuver uh, of, of uh, not good taste, like, like he used to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, well, we, we we had we had a chance also with our pianist Sergei Solodovnik. He was playing always all music by by heart, and at any moment we could ask him to play any piece of our repertoire. 
he was uh, like uh, in panic a uh, few seconds, but okay, okay, I, I don't need the music. So he was playing with, without the score. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. Yeah. And I, I'm proud to be his student. This is first scene and uh, I miss him very much. And uh, Duchess had tried for years to get Dmitry Shostakovich to write a trumpet concerto, but the composer never found the time. When Shostakovich passed away, Timothy decided to arrange Shostakovich's first piano concerto, which already had a substantial trumpet part, for solo trumpet, piano, and strings. Despite Doc Chester's worldwide celebrity, he was always a down-to-earth person who loved to have a good time. He also had a fine sense of humor. My mother always brings up, um, you know, it's not a story I remember because I was very, very young. I must have been a toddler who just started talking. Um, but my grandfather, you know, again, he loved a good joke. He loved to laugh. He loved just laughter in the house. And I guess when I just began talking, he would ask me, he would say, who are you? In Russian, of course. And I would say, I would say, I'm Dakshitsur. And he would say, no, I'm Dakshitsur. And I would say, no, I'm Dakshitsur. And he would say, no, I'm Dakshitsur. So, and that went on for quite a while and everybody was amused and, um, yeah, my mother says that he, that was one of his favorite pastimes <laughs> with me, so. Doc Titzer greatly enjoyed corresponding with friends, family, and fellow trumpeters, often exchanging gifts. He was just, he was always such a gentleman. And I think his legacy, so many young people have, you know, they don't really get it. Even some of them don't even know who Adolf Herseth was, the younger generation. And I think that's sad. On the train. You know, remember when those suitcases came out, those big Samsonites that were on wheels and had the strap on it to pull? He used to call me Joyce on wheels because I was always pulling that along. But I always took a lot of music and mouthpieces and mutes and stuff when I went to, to Russia and to Ukraine because they couldn't get it then. Everything yeah. he said, you had to really put into your library up here because when he spoke music and he talked about uh, human kindness, you know, it was... So it was something to behold. He was, he was magnificent. And my grandfather loved writing letters. He wrote us letters so often, um, just telling us how much he misses us and asking me about my schoolwork and, uh, you know, asking about 
our life in general and sending postcards. Um, he really stayed in touch. We stayed in touch um, quite a bit. As a warm-hearted human being, Doc Jitzer was not afraid to show his affection towards others. After the teaching, I said to uh, Timofey, Timofey, I pick you up in the hotel, 7.30, 8 o'clock is the concert with Clark Terry. Oh, I'm an old man. I'm so tired. I said, no. I pick you up, you go to the Oh, to look, I'm so, I'm, I'm so tired. I'm, I'm old. I get, I... So I picked him up and he was sitting the ho beside stage, the whole concert. And after the concert, he came to me, oh, thank you so much that you, that you took me to, it was, so he was so happy to, to listen to Clark Terry. He was so, it was wonderful. You know? <laughs> was, oh, yet aboard. Yeah. yeah. When he was in the hospital. Uh, yeah. Well, he became, he had, was having palpitations or something. And uh, Andrei Ekov and Olga Braslavsky and Volodya, his brother, Vladimir uh, Dokshitzer, they went, they took him to the hospital. I said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. They had done nothing for him, but put him on a gurney and had him up to an EKG and, or yeah, whatever. And I walked in and I go, hello, I'm Dr. Davis. And I'm Mr. I'm with Mr. Dokshitzer, the well-known legendary Russian trumpet player. So after that, they thought I was his real doctor. Oh, okay. Not a P not, not uh, an MD, not a you know DMA or PhD. So they, they were telling me all this stuff, and um, I acted like I knew what was going on because my father was a medical doctor. So uh, it you know it didn't make some sense to me, but uh, he would not let go of me. I stayed with him till we got him settled in his room and stayed for a while and all that stuff. And uh, it was kind of frightening to think that they were putting that in my hands, but you know, it was cool. And we had breakfast with Philip Jones and all these things. And I got on him about, don't eat that <laughs> because he would eat all this stuff that wasn't so great for your heart at times. I, at my last concert with the Dallas Symphony was in 1969 in um, April, I believe. And the soloist was Mrs. Mrs. Slav Rostropovich, who I went into Rostropovich's dressing room after the first intermission. And I said to him, um, Maestro, do you know my friend Timofey Dokshitzer? And in this big Russian bare voice, he said, when I conduct Bolshoi, no Timofey, no conduct. Now, you know, they had two co-principals, so what he was saying there, but it turns out that they were terrifically close friends. They, they were very, very close. And when, when Rostropovich defected to the United States, that really more or less ended their being able to talk and so forth. So the day that he played at U of I, I, I was given Slava, you know, his nickname was Slava. Uh, Rush Povich. I was given his phone number for his New York apartment. So I found out what hotel uh, Timofey was staying in in Urbana probably and called uh, Slava and I said, um, is it okay for you to talk to uh, your dear friend? And he said, oh, be wonderful. So he called, I got the number of the hotel and the room number that Timo was in and for one hour solid, they, they spoke. And when the fo phone call finished, um, Timofey called me here in DeKalb and he just said, if liebe dir, you know what that means, I love you. And he said he had such a fantastic reunion with his dear, dear friend, Rostropovich and uh, it was just wonderful. Well, I, I was gonna but share you... one uh, that was my father's favorite. That's that same visit uh, when Mr. D came to Uzbekistan. Um, he really wanted to 
bring back some oriental sweets for the family in Moscow. So my father took him to the, the old part, part of the city. It was called Chorsu Bazaar. And at that time, in 68, 67, um, women uh, couldn't sell anything at uh, places like this. So there were uh, only men, older men with white beards and uh, uh, wearing silk robes and uh, skull caps and turbans. So of course they all wanted uh, uh, Mr. D to buy something and him being such a gentle soul and um, very kind to people, he didn't know which one to pick. So uh, his decision was sort of like uh, Solomon, uh, King Solomon's decision. He bought a little bit from everyone. Oh. So, and uh, everybody was so impressed and they just, uh, and they gave him more sweets just because he was such a, such a considerate person. For the last story about Doc Chitzer, uh, I'd like to go back to when he had dinner at my home when I was teaching in Illinois. And uh, at the end of the dinner, we talked about taking him to the airport in Chicago the next day so he could fly back to Moscow. And uh, he pulls out of his pocket this big wad of $100 bills, a little gangster roll with rubber band around it. And he peeled off three $100 bills and put them in his pocket and said, that's a gratuity for my friend at the Ministry of Culture. But I must spend the rest of this before we go back to Moscow because uh, Russians were not allowed to have uh, American money. So uh, he knew that the customs people in Moscow would take it from him. So he wanted to know if we had time to go shopping before we had to leave to Chicago. That was no problem. So my interpreter and I agreed to pick him up at, you know, nine in the morning. And uh, so we, we picked him up. I said, what, what would you like to buy? He said, well, uh, the first thing I want to buy is a book on how to make a fireplace. Because if you remember, he was given this little cottage in the woods, which I found out he later just tore it down and built a, a very nice two-story cottage, uh, which became their summer home. Uh, but he wanted to build a fireplace himself. So we went to a fireplace store and he bought a book on how to build a fireplace and bought another book on pictures of beautiful fireplaces. And then um, the second thing he wanted to buy was one of those little cassette players, a Sony Walkman, which were brand new at the time. And uh, so we found a store and he bought one of those and bought 20 classical cassette tapes to go with it. And then uh, he still had quite a bit of money. In fact, he mentioned that that was about two years salary for him in Russian money. So um, he wanted to buy dresses for his wife, Mona. So we went to a shopping mall and there was a big Macy's department store. And we went into the women's section and the saleswoman comes over and talks to us and explained that he wanted to buy dresses for his wife. She said, what size? And he had no idea. So we looked around and he saw another sales lady. He said, like her. So they inquired and got the right size. He said, I want to buy the most, uh, the nicest, most expensive dresses you have. So she takes him into this one area and there's this big circular rack of dresses. So she finds the right size, says, okay, from here, to here would be the correct size. He smiled and just put his arms around the whole bundle, took it over to the counter and plopped them down, takes out the big wad of money, hands it to her, and she just checked them off until the money was gone. I think he bought 20 or 25 dresses. They put them in a big box and put twine around it and put his name and address on it. And we took it to Chicago and he got it on the plane, and took it back. Just shows what a, what a thoughtful, generous man he was. In closing, I hope this video celebrating the life and career of Timothy Dokchitzer has given viewers a better appreciation of this musical genius. His contributions to the trumpet world will live forever. Happy birthday, Tima!